so that you can get back to your seats on that. Oh, you already are. <laughs> I should have looked up. <laughs> um, okay, so, all right. I'm really curious to hear about what your experience of that exercise was. If anybody would like to share either mm -hmm. something that they learned or um, about themselves or from this exercise. You, right. you look like you have we some really, We really bonded over it. Yeah. We really had a lot in common that we shared in a very short amount of time. Very good. So, so you, you felt like you it, it was a bonding experience and you mm -hmm. had a lot in common. A lot in common and like we understood it. Yeah. Similar, Sim similar limits. And limits, yeah. All right, all right, very good. So. Thank you. I ended up parroting back what he was saying because yeah. it just felt so, so, so true. And yeah. sometimes when you were speaking, I wanted so bad to interrupt and say, but, but no, I thought I got the answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's important to, yeah, it, it's sometimes you want to you want to come in and tell people. Go ahead and do that, or whatever, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, good. Thank you. Yeah. Did you have something to share, Eddie? I was sharing with her that how we could always feel that we limit ourselves. I, I'm, I'm from a different country, as you can tell from my accent. And we used to live in an environment where everybody would limit you, no matter how much potential you have, how much power you have, how much ambition you have. You will feel that environment around you always restricts you. When you come to this country, when you feel like the only enemy you have left is really you, that it's always limiting you. You have the potential, you have the environment, you have the all the elements for success, but you always go back to that, you know, the weakness inside you and the limitation that you created through the life experiences and obviously family and stuff like that. that you always hold yourself back. Nobody's holding you in this country. Doing anything, the only one is holding you, is really holding you, it's not yourself. So can we personalize that, and um, can you say the only one that's holding me back is myself? Can you yeah. say, try that on? Yeah, the only one that's holding me back is really myself. And right. I, I do it to myself, nobody else does it. Yeah, just try it out. Does that feel right to you? It, it always it feels right. You could, you know, I think the mind has two, two sides to it. You could have the ration and it's telling you this is exactly what it is, but when you go to the practical way, you can not do it. Okay, well, but in terms of just that one sentence, does that one sentence feel accurate to you? Yeah, it feels accurate to you. Okay, Very just accurate. stick with that for now. Yeah, one thing at a time. <laughs> right. Okay, good, good. Anybody else want to share experience? I don't want to force it here. Just I can relate to what... Um, Mary had said to just uh, relating to um, maybe Eric who said it. Sorry, but just relating to what they were saying about things to themselves that were limiting. It's like oh, I can relate to that. I used to say that to myself. You know that kind of stuff, which is yeah kind of interesting in a way because you know I always think it's just me that thinks this way. <laughs> yeah, the limits so, that we place on ourselves. Yeah. So and and, um, and then to hear it, somebody else say it. To, like, to think about it for that person, that's not true for that person. You know what I mean? Yes. And then to realize, well, I say stuff like that to myself that's not true, that kind of stuff. That's an excellent that's point. That's not um, the truth for me, is what I mean. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So, yeah. It's sometimes it's easier, like, well, we hear the similarity in what other mm -hmm. people are saying, but it's easier to hear that it's, you know, a myth. Right. Or it's false for someone else, but... Right. But when it's applied to ourselves, it seems like it's real. Right, exactly. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So it's neat to hear it because then you, when you go through that, I think it helps to break that down within yourself. You know, mm -hmm. like that's it makes you question whether some of what you're telling yourself is yeah. accurate or whether it's, you know, right, exactly. maybe not as true as you thought. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think of myself as, like, achieving a whole lot. And you know, I mean, that kind of stuff where you don't think... Yeah, it's just my mindset, I guess. But when I really sit down and I think about everything I really have achieved, it's quite an impressive list, you know, even if I do say so myself. And I think sometimes we get so, I'm speaking for myself, I get so down on myself, so negative about myself, that I discount everything I've done in my life. You know, I'm really hard on myself. You know, and mm -hmm. I, I see where this can... Uh, right. 
too. Right. Exactly. And I'm glad you brought that up too. So sometimes we we give ourselves we this is actually a cognitive error, you know, mm-hmm. where we will um, give more attention to what we can't do or don't do well, and less attention to what we have done well and what we do well. So one of the ways to contradict that bias is to actually make a list of all of our successes and so that we can remember that and recall that as, because you know if, we, if you realize that most people have I can't say for sure how many people but often people have this bias and if you realize that you, if you're holding that particular bias then what you can do is just contradict it so kind of like if we know our um, if we were scientists and we know our equipment makes this one systematic error all the time whenever we're measuring something. So we know, okay, well, it's a systematic error. It's always off by half a degree. So whatever result I get, I'm going to add half a degree to it because I know it's just slightly off. Well, it's the same same thing here. We're going to um, just add to the part where it's slightly off, you know, by making a list of our successes. Yeah. So that, that would be a great exercise for anybody who feels like they have that bias. Um, because it would help you to highlight your strengths and your successes. Just keeping a list of that, a log of that. Having to find a job, you know, you kind of have to go through that whole, you know, you have to do that. So. Um, and, and you might do that, um, too, um, in, in areas that you would never bring to a job interview. Like, I'm a good cook, <laughs> or whatever. You know, I'm really compassionate with my children. Something like that, mm-hmm. so depending on what, where you think your strengths are. All right, so very good. Any other uh, things come up for people in that exercise? They want to share or process? And so what did you learn in terms of um, how you might be limiting yourself in your life? I seem to be um, tired. <laughs> okay, so you... So time, I have a time issue. Time. Time. You know, I'm always thinking about time. Yes. So we're thinking, anybody else have a time issue? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Right. So that is partly why I wrote that book, how to make time when you don't have any, because it's, it's like one of the number one excuses that people make for themselves. I don't have time for that. And really, if you stop and look at it, it's not about the time. It's about the choice. It's about the priorities. It's about where you're what you're deciding to do and not do. So it's really choice management is the argument my book makes, not time management. Yeah. All right, so uh, good, good point. Anybody else want to share um, how they find themselves slowing themselves down in life or stopping themselves even through a limiting belief? Self-doubt. Self-doubt, okay. Okay, like I have a story that I've actually had a lot of people ask me to write Okay, mm-hmm. and I just don't have the confidence to do it. And I've got a master's in literature. Okay, so wow. I, mean, I can Brilliant. write. Yeah, you know? I just don't have confidence. Right there, we go. Okay, so it's so the self doubt can be a slowing mechanism. Yeah, for things you really want to do, you have a you have a skill set that is right there, ripe and ready to be right. used. Right. Yeah, but. I don't finish it. You know. It's, it, I'm sure a lot of it, I ran away from home, and I'm sure a lot of it's kind of painful coming back up, you know, so I don't want to quit out necessarily. I might go out. Yeah. Like that. Emotional pain. Emotional mm-hmm. pain. Yeah. Brings back, you know. But everybody wants to make it glamorous, you know. Sometimes it's the, so you, you were bonding before with Mary, so sometimes it's when we become vulnerable that we are able to bond with each other. Right. See. So sometimes that it's that it's that vulnerability that connects people to your work. Something to think about. Um, all right. Well, I in the interest of time, I'm going to move us on to this discussion. So I, I was hoping that you would take a look at that. That some of what we do to limit ourselves is based on our self-talk, and that is really what this is the crux of this type of therapy is um, and coaching is really looking at the psychology behind how we limit ourselves and how we feel, how we decrease confidence. Um, <clears throat> so both of these, ther- both of these um, RBT and CBT will, sell, will say that it is what you tell yourself 
that matters. And not just what you tell yourself, but what you believe. Right? You can tell yourself whatever, but if you don't believe it, what's the good of it? Right? Mm -hmm. All right. So REBT, though, emphasizes something about confidence that CBT doesn't. CBT will say that, you know, um, it's, it's important to work on your confidence and, um, you know, it's how you feel about yourself and stuff like that. Um, REBT actually has a little bit of a different angle because REBT talks about um, a kind of a deeper philosophical change that it's emphasizing. And it's um, unconditional self-acceptance, unconditional other acceptance, and unconditional life acceptance. And those are abbreviated USA, UOA, and ULA. So there's this big emphasis on acceptance of the self. And why that's important is because if you accept yourself, you are you feel fine whether or not you behaved well or you behaved poorly. You might feel regret or remorse if you behave poorly, but you don't rate yourself. So you don't damn or down yourself if you do something poorly or if you make a mistake. Um, so it's and it's actually okay if you go into a situation feeling nervous or feeling a little concerned with REBT because you accept yourself. Now, you might want to work on shifting out of nervousness and into healthy concern, but you can accept yourself even if you don't, okay? Um, so it's, the emphasis is on self-acceptance rather than self-confidence. Where confidence comes in is in skill. So REBT talks about confidence really being work confidence or skill confidence. So you become confident at playing a musical instrument by practicing it. When you start playing the musical instrument, you're not as confident. So when, uh, so it's normal to not be as confident because you don't have the mastery yet. And so there's a road to gaining that confidence and it comes through practice. And it comes through skill. Sometimes it comes through learning from somebody who has mastery where you don't. Um, but the self is never a part of that. We want, we want to avoid self-rating with our ABT. So I think that for me that's kind of freeing. I don't have to worry about putting myself into it. You know, if I'm confident speaking to a certain group, that doesn't mean I have high self-confidence or low self-confidence. It just means I have high skill confidence in that setting. <laughs> okay? So it's, it's, not a, um, it's not one of those things where I have this trait or I don't have this trait. It's just, it's just where I am in my evolution on this skill. And I can have high skill confidence about speaking to my meetup group and have low skill confidence about bungee jumping, <laughs> okay? Or, and I can have high skill confidence when I'm coaching someone and have low skill confidence in the area of um, talking about the history of the world with my children. I have to go on Google all the time and look stuff up. What was that date? Who was that leader? I don't remember. Um, what, ha what was that battle about again? <laughs> you know, that's not, not an area that I have high skill confidence in because I don't practice it. So what's refreshing to me about this model is it really is all about practicing, working, and, um, and learning. And, and it takes the self out. You don't rate yourself on it. You don't, your value um, isn't part of the conversation because you just, you just are. We don't have to put a price tag on you. You know, um, that's, uh, that's an optional story that, that we put on to ourselves. We decide, okay, I am worthless, or I am worth more, you know. I mean, these are just ratings that we place upon the self. Uh, we don't actually have to be doing that. That's just a story we've decided to tell. And so Ellis said that actually psychologists were in error when we started to emphasize self-esteem, which ties into this conversation, self-esteem being... Um, okay, well, I feel good about myself when I do this. And um, if I have this, then I can feel good about myself. If I create this outcome, then I can feel good. It's called contingent or conditional self-acceptance. Whereas our EBT is emphasizing unconditional or non-contingent self-acceptance. So you, you accept yourself regardless. Um, so isn't that what we expect of others as well? Um, unconditional life acceptance, ULA. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, what was your I'm question? Sorry, isn't that what we expect of others as well? I mean, what, I'm sorry, what? The contingencies. 
you know, you treat. That would be, a, yeah, that would be contingent other acceptance or conditional 